Hello, everyone. Welcome to EPIC. There's a number of new faces here. And um, uh, this is the first time we've actually opened it to the, to the general campus. So welcome those of you who are not uh, members of EPIC. Um, I'm Jean Stellman. I'm the president. Um, if you are an emeritus and, and want to know more about the organization, we please come and see, see me or Deanna. And um, I, I'm, I'm not going to do the introductions I've had. I've asked uh, Ferdinand Ofadili to introduce our speaker. And those of you who are epicers have heard um, have heard Dr. Ofadili and about his wonderful work in his post-plastic surgery career in, in Nigeria. So I, I thought he would be the perfect person to introduce our speaker. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Jean sent me an email uh, that I should introduce uh, Dr. Phillips, and he um, was going to speak about Biafra. So I wrote back to her that I had been in Biafra towards the end of the war, um, knowing Jean, she wants everybody to be friends and uh, such an enabler. So I said, I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Phillips. And she did. And I called Dr. Phillips. And uh, it happened that we were in Biafra at the same time um, in 1969. We didn't meet, but he was doing God's work. And I was... I just uh, I was finishing my internship at that time. I took two weeks to go to uh, Biafra. I didn't know what I was doing, but I I got to see my my parents, and uh, in the process, I also met my wife and got married at six thirty in the morning uh, because of uh, fear of uh, uh, um, bombing from uh, uh, Nigerian MiG fighters. Um, so it, it's going to, it has a wonderful story, and I'm sure that uh, you, you all will be fascinated with his experience. Um, professor uh, Phillips is a professor emeritus and special lecturer at the Department of Population and Family Health at Millman School of Public Health, where he does research in the area of health systems development in Africa. Um, some of you may already know him, so I, it doesn't need an introduction. He obtained his bachelor's and doctorate degrees from the University of Michigan and holds a master's degree from the University of Hawaii. Professor Phillips has a very impressive resume with academic and research works that span the globe. Uh, including many African and Asian countries. He has published over 195 scientific uh, articles and several books and has received several prestigious professional awards. His CV runs over 50 pages. <laughs> so to do justice to his uh, immense achievement, I would have to use up the one hour allotted to him um, for his lecture. So I will just focus on the early parts of his career uh, that are most relevant to, to today's lecture. His professional career started as a, use, uh, as, as a U.S. Uh, Peace Corps volunteer in Nigeria. As destiny would have it, this was the period of the first and most tragic political turmoil in the newly independent nation. An initial coup d'etat by junior officers was followed by a counter coup and a pogrom resulting in the massacre of thousands of Nigerians of Igbo ethnic origin. The subsequent declaration of independence by the eastern part of Nigeria the home of the Igbos led to a most brutal 
and devastating civil war, resulting in mass starvation and loss of over one million people. Professor Phillips was an eyewitness to this tra tragedy from both the Nigerian and Biafran sides. He served as an assistant area coordinator for the International Red Cross during the height of the war and was coordinating their very high risk relief de delivery and uh, distribution operation. At the end of the war, he functioned as a UN forward observer assigned to the division of the Nigerian army that ended the war. The title of today's lecture, Biafra at 50, is quite topical because there's renewed and growing and violent agitation for the rebirth of Biafra in the eastern part of Nigeria. Unfortunately, the agitations and the government reactions to them are eerily similar to what happened 50 years ago. We have not learned from history. Professor Phillips will touch on these and share with us lessons learned from his analysis of the Biafran War, lessons that, if taken to heart, will mitigate the possibility of another catastrophe. Professor Phillips is uniquely qualified to offer these lessons. We look forward to a fascinating lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming. I want to uh, start by uh, reminding everyone what the news, watching the news in the late. There were two civil wars on opposite sides of the planet. So you saw images of Vietnam, or you saw images of Biafra. And uh, these two wars had a great deal of American involvement. In the case of Vietnam, we were trying to divide a people into two countries after millennia of existing with a common language and culture and even political tradition. American policy was trying to create two Vietnams. But in the case of Nigeria, the country uh, it was comprised of people without historic ground. They had different languages, cultures, and traditions. And the American policy there was one Nigeria. Let's unify these disparate people into a common, uh, 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 a common uh, country with a common political. Uh, so that was a contradiction. But uh, the one thing these two conflicts in have in common is that the adversity and suffering was roughly equivalent. Perhaps two million Vietnamese died, perhaps about two million uh, Nigerians died. Uh, and, and this context, far uh, greater catastrophe in the sense that Vietnam had a much bigger population, uh, a huge crisis for the Igbo people of uh, then the part of that country. I have six themes. I'm going, going through. I have to be quick because I have not uh, cut slides uh, as I had planned. I'm going to go through these themes. I thought maybe it would be good uh, to start with a discussion, a little bit of the history. Nigeria actually an, an amalgamation of ancient uh, uh, cultures. Uh, people of the north, the uh, House of Fulani people, have for centuries had a common language and system of governance. And there were people uh, to the uh, south who s had similar uh, se but separate traditions of cultural identity and governance. The Yoruba, the west, the Igbo to the southeast, and uh, then there's the middle belt. But if you take all these people uh, as, as separate uh, cultural or ethno-linguistic groups, there are nearly 500 different languages and traditions in Nigeria. 92% though speak one of three languages. 
Hausa, Yoruba, or Igbo. So it's a highly uh, diverse country, but it has three um, uh, ethno-linguistic groups. The British uh, originally landed there as part of the uh, uh, program of uh, ending the slave trade from the region and creating a, a, a domain of British authority that eventually was led by this gentleman, Lord Lugard. He was a brilliant British ambas uh, ambassador and administrator who was reposted from Hong Kong, a uh, difficult assignment, to Nigeria. And his major achievement was to consolidate uh, the British interest in what was southern and eastern and northern uh, Nigeria into a consolidated colony, uh, which he completed uh, just before the onset of the First World War. Nigeria then became a British uh, uh, force to deal with uh, neighboring German colonies, uh, Togo and uh, Cameroon. The name Nigeria was actually uh, contrived by Lord Lugard's wife. Uh, it's not a it wasn't a Nigerian to come up with this term, so it's a British uh, invention. Uh, and um, uh, Lugard uh, is, in British colonial history, uh, viewed as a very successful, brilliant administrator who created uh, a political monstrosity uh, that is, uh, in a sense, um, uh, was effective as the way it was indirectly ruled because he recognized the historic differences of these regions in ways that polarized rather than integrated Nigeria into a common entity. So, the eastern region, the western region, the northern region were administered very separately and, uh, and uh, the central, the idea of a colonial power coming in with a central mission, philosophy, political identity, whatever it takes to integrate a people was instead polarized by the way uh, colonial administration uh, took place. So uh, that set the stage not for an integrated country, but for uh, a rather delicate period of political negotiation that led to the creation in Nigeria. The prime minister, the initial prime minister, was a very uh, powerful figure. He was from the north. Uh, President uh, Azikwe was politically weak in the original constitution, but he was an Igbo who had been raised in the north, so he spoke fluent Hausa, and he could form a political alliance because he's very agile with uh, the uh, languages and cultures of the north. So Azikwe was a bridge. He was a prof profoundly important nationalist in the creed. So, the irony here is that the political group that dominated the creation of the unified Nigeria were the very people who led the Biafra secessionist movement. Corruption, malaise, difficulty set in that led to a coup, as uh, Fernando pointed out, by junior officers. He was chief of staff as General Ar Aransi he inherited the outcome of the coup without being an instigator of it. But he was Igbo, and he was blamed as an Igbo for the fact that Igbos were not victims of that first coup. Uh, the people who died as uh, political leaders were, ten it were predominantly Hausa or Yoruba, and that led to uh, organized uh, uh, opposition. First, there was a counter coup leading to the uh, uh, demise of General Aranzi and uh, pogroms. So 
Igbo people had moved all over Nigeria. They were the commercial elite. They were the teachers. They were the engineers. They were the lawyers. They were the predominantly educated group. They were all over the country, but they were resented for their political and economic uh, dominance. And that led to violent uh, uh, activity that caused a movement of, uh, of, of fleeing of the Igbos, uh, fleeing for their lives, uh, starting in 1965, as I recall. Uh, and uh, that led then to counter-violence. And the northerners who were in evil land fled north to their homeland. And what you had then was a country by 1967 that was essentially a separate domain of Hausa-dominated, Yoruba-dominated, Igbo-dominated people. Anybody who had settled outside their homeland had fled back home. And uh, the military leader of the country, who was installed by a series of compromise, was 35 years old, or yeah, 35 years old. He was from a small uh, ethno-linguistic group in the Middle Belt. He was put in charge because he could not be in charge. He was a weak uh, figure uh, who, uh, he was a Christian from the north, that was important, but he had a very little natural political base within this army. This guy, uh, Oxford educated historian, uh, uh, Colonel Ojuku, was made governor of the eastern region and inherited all the aftermath of this pogrom. All the people coming home maimed and, and starving and in a difficult situation were his people and his responsibility. He was Igbo. And these guys had gone through their military training together at Sandhurst. They were both in their 30s. They knew one another. They were friends uh, uh, during their training. Uh, oh, the country just polarized. Further and further and further, there was arms importation. There was uh, uh, anticipation of major conflict. The uh, Ghanaians anticipated the need for a, an accord. So the general in charge of, uh, who had <laughs> staged his own coup in Ghana, pulled these guys together and they developed what was called the Aburi Accord. And this accord arrived at agreements to end arms importation uh, and, and solve all these political problems that were polarizing the country. Uh, it was a remarkable diplomatic achievement orchestrated by the Ghanaians and agreed to by all the parties of this conference. The Biafra uh, didn't exist. This was January of 1967. These guys came to an agreement, but the British did not like it. They wanted to have their own negotiated agreement on a warship off the Nigerian coast. No one involved on either side wanted to go back to the British to negotiate their problem. So the British sabotaged the Aburi Agreement. And no one really abided by it, even though it was the fundamental basis for a solution to this crisis. The Americans were preoccupied by Vietnam. And uh, Kissinger, he, oh, by the way, now 50 years later, you can go back and you can see all this cable traffic and uh, stuff going on. You can actually see CIA records and, and uh, the American sentiment was, whoa, stay away from this. This is a mess. Uh, let, let them duke it out. So uh, this demonstrated that regional diplomacy could work, but it needed to be endorsed and supported and 
embraced by the international powers. My sister uh, was a historian uh, at Oxford, and they had a bookstore there. I sent her a cable that, oh, about Biafra's. I said, Biafra's this new idea, new country. This is in May. She said, no, no, no. And she sent me this map from uh, 1747 that she found somewhere in a bookstore. Biafra uh, was not new. Uh, but uh, Ojuku was an historian. And he picked this name with the understanding of his colleagues, mainly jurists in the establishment. Biafra would be this territory. And uh, on May 30th, uh, uh, 67, they declared independence. Gowan immediately declared there'd be a police action. Just clean this up. We'll just go in and have a police action. Biafra then made a huge mistake, political mistake. And what they did is they put together their ragtag army with some uh, armored cars that they had manufactured, and they invaded. And they went all the way to the western region to Ore. They occupied the Midwest region of the country and, uh, and threatened to go north to the Benue River, scaring the Yoruba people into being Nigerian rather than, oh, a Wola Wol, I think. Uh, there's a, a political leader of Western Nigeria, Obafemi Owolowo. Owolowo was from a village just to the south of, uh, of Ore. He saw this as a major threat where the Igbos are going to dominate Yoruba land. So rather than seceding, it pulled Nigerian forces together and created a unified Nigerian opposition to Biafra. And uh, that disaster was in 67. And the Nigerians quickly put together an invading army that surrounded Biafra and pushed uh, 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 Biafran forces away from the coast, away from the north, away from the west, uh, from out of uh, this uh, area of the country called the Midwest. These invasions were genocidal. The Nigerian army coming in would just wipe out anybody who was there. So everybody fled because they knew that these troops were under order to kill anybody who was there or did anything that moved. It was horrible. So what happened was the population then imploded into an enclave. Uh, it wasn't like somebody could stay behind and negotiate, or there could be a guerrilla movement. There couldn't be a guerrilla movement because there was nothing left but bush. Uh, and uh, that had a horrific uh, uh, economic and nutritional consequences that we'll now discuss. There was, uh, first of all, uh, a fairly early crisis involving the migrants. Remember, people like a million people poured in from before this war. They were the most vulnerable. They didn't have land. They didn't have uh, uh, resources. So, and uh, people migrated to escape this conflict. Uh, oh, this is not a very clear picture. But you could see movements of people in large groups. Uh, and what uh, is a better picture? Uh, by the way, if you see a W, it means uh, the picture is taken from the web. If you don't see the W, I took the picture. Okay? So these are my pictures. I was not allowed to take pictures. I was not allowed to have a camera. 
But from time to time, I would run into somebody who had equipment or something, like a reporter or something, and I would borrow a camera. So my pictures were taken in four episodes, okay, over about a year. Uh, but uh, uh, so here's a W, right? This is an example of an extended family. There's no such thing as an individual in Evo land, okay? Individuals are embedded in their nuclear family, but the nuclear family, defining who's a brother and who's a sister, is a, a collective entity, and are embedded in a group or a clan. Everybody who's a brother and a sister is at some layer of the onion, but it doesn't matter where you are. You are a brother or a sister, no matter what. So when this war started and people had to move, there's profound resilience associated with this uh, very robust social system of sharing trust and social interaction. People move, they move together. If they had food, they shared the food. If they had to have shelter, they took care of one another somehow. If there's somebody away somewhere, I'm sure you had to find a way to get resources to your people because you were a brother to a thousand other brothers. And that resilience is not the kind of thing we know anything about here. When we had Hurricane Katrina, we fell apart. You know, we just, you know, everybody becomes an individual in our, our, our culture. Uh, there, it's the opposite. Everybody uh, becomes a brother and a sister. People lived in quite modern uh, accommodation, but when they moved, they constructed these um, instant villages everywhere, along the roadside, uh, schoolyards, uh, church compounds, anywhere you could look, you could see these settlements. So uh, Biafra became a tenth the size of its original area, plus all the people who had migrated from other parts of the country living like this. And all of a sudden in these kind of grass uh, shanty areas, uh, uh, Temporary housing uh, put up very quickly from temporary materials. Bridges were blown by the army to prevent a Nigerian advance. That created a problem because sometimes the, uh, the Biafran army would advance, but they'd already blown their bridges. And uh, so it was a, a, a conflict in a riverine deltaic area where these bridges were incredibly important. This slowed down movement, but was not a very effective um, uh, way to reference to launch a, uh, a, a, um, an offense. This bridge was blown with hundreds of people on it when it was blown. So this, this kind of destruction uh, sometimes led to great loss of life. The roads that were left uh, had no transport. A gallon of petro, if you converted the Biafran pound into dollars at the official rate, a gallon I think was $56 a gallon. Uh, so there wasn't much movement of, of equipment and uh, roads going to the front were just this is a modern road that had just been overgrown. Smuggling proliferated, so the rivers became smuggling routes. A lot of tra trade went across the Niger River and through the Delta and so on. Uh, a lot of, uh, I mean, it's a part of, part of the world that transitioned well beyond this kind of uh, commerce, right? But they reverted to tradition to, uh, to engage in trade. Uh, and, and keep people alive. Markets, again, this is not very clear picture, uh, but markets 
Egypt were routinely bombed and strafed by the Nigerian Air Force. So Marka continued, but they put them in the bush and camouflaged them uh, very effectively so that uh, commerce could continue. Uh, oil was plentiful in the ground, but was refined elsewhere. They developed oil refineries, backyard oil refineries. And they could not only refine oil, they could make brake fluid and you know, hydraulic fuel. Uh, the chemists at the uh, Biafran uh, universities were incredibly uh, innovative and in keeping uh, an industrial economy going uh, in a situation of great conflict. By 1968, the nutritional crisis was converted into a land army response. So every corner of the country, every yard, every bit of space was converted into uh, agricultural uh, land. Uh, and that was uh, a well-organized uh, program of agricultural intensification. Uh, so, because 1968 was catastrophic. There were about a thousand children a day dying in Red Cross facilities. Uh, many more dying than that, for sure. But a, a thousand children. This is a cassava field. It doesn't show up very clearly. But uh, cassava is a with no protein. So you can intensify. Uh, protein, uh, uh, cow production, but protein biochemically and environmentally is a far more intricate thing. So you, as you intensify agricultural productivity quickly, you leave protein behind. And that means that you have young children in, uh, in a desperate state even though they're getting calories, they're not getting protein. And uh, edema, this is ascites. You could just spot these kids anywhere you look. There are children taking care of children. That was common. Both these children are severely malnourished. Uh, this was uh, a, uh, a series of images that generated global concern. But the elderly were also affected. So elderly were very vulnerable and, and suffered uh, horribly in this war. Well, there was a military response. First, uh, Biafra just took any gun that would shoot anything they could get their hands on. And they mobilized an army that had a lot of soldiers but no weapons. And their weapons were these bold action Enfield single shot rifles. Uh, the Nigerians were supplied by the British and the Russians. So uh, this uh, looks like a British rifle to me. Uh, but in the AK-47 had the uh, curved uh, magazine. But these guys were well armed, but not very motivated. So it, as they moved about, they would form an encampment and kind of sit. Uh, the motivation to fight this conflict was definitely a uh, Afrin-inspired, uh, uh, dedicated war. This is my hand, okay, so I'm putting my hand up here. This is a rocket-repelled uh, 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 grenade. So this thing would go on the end of a rifle, maybe an infield rifle, and the guy would pull the trigger, and that thing became a rocket. That was made in Biafra by Biafrans in large numbers. So they had anti-tank weapons and anti-artillery weapons that they used very effectively that they made themselves. Uh, and they had rockets that, I, I, I mean, these were amazing things. As they said, they made fire of these rockets all at once. And the Nigerian army might not have been very well organized, so 
It just would create pandemonium. Everybody would just fled, and then they would move forward. Biafras would move forward. But then there would be a counter uh, uh, insurgency. This is a bulldozer that had been armor plated and made into a tank. Okay? So they, they could do these things. After the war, there was a problem. They would, the Biafras would tunnel under a highway. There'd be nothing there. Then uh, you'd, a vehicle would be driving along and they'd fall through the tarmac because they hollowed out the area under it. If it was an armored vehicle, a Nigerian vehicle, they would then destroy it. They'd put a Molotov cocktail on top of the thing and blow it up. So it was an inventive way to create a, a front out of what had been a modern highway. Then when the war ended, these guys just left all this ordinance around. And kids would either pick them up or, this is, it's reverse actually, it's Yale. <laughs> and this t-shirt, but he had his his foot had just been destroyed because he stepped on a uh, a grenade. Thirty uh, thirty eight countries got involved. Okay, so huge political engagement. Iceland uh, is one of them. Australia, uh, you know, Japan. The first deployment of German army uh, uh, units since World War II. The first Japanese deployment, international deployment of a Japanese unit since World War II. Uh, they were not there to fight a war, except for the Germans. The East Germans were involved in Soviet-delivered uh, 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 weaponry and war. German uh, church organizations were involved with uh, Biafra and German Red Cross was a German military unit assigned to the Nigerian Red Cross. So Germany is the only country that's on all sides. The UN, uh, this is the second uh, UN general, uh, 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 Director General Udant, uh, he believed that the UN should be uh, uh, avoiding direct involvement, should stick by uh, recognizing sovereignty, on, uh, and was very legalistic. He denied uh, diplomatic opportunities to Biafra. It was a big uh, problem for the Biafra side. But the UN was only part of the problem for Biafra there were also lines of support. Sometimes they're a bit surprising. They got arms from China uh, and uh, support from the new Republic of Equatorial Guinea, which had been uh, Spanish. Uh, but there's a large Igbo population in uh, Equatorial Guinea. So uh, that country was ambivalent and waffled back and forth and it was rather unpredictable and what they were going to do. Uh, many countries were concerned about secessionist movements at home and were reluctant to get involved. Others were uh, very aggressively uh, concerned about uh, uh, the political uh, history of Nigeria and uh, Tanzania and Zambia uh, supported Biafra quite actively. French involvement led to Cote d'Ivoire, Gabon, and Benin uh, uh, getting uh, involved with support for Biafra. Uh, Israel uh, provided a huge line of support secretly. So aircraft involved in the airlift were maintained by Israeli units operating in Portugal and Spain and uh, Israel itself. Uh, so, uh, and of course we know uh, Ethiopia eventually fell apart 
But during this conflict, Haile Selassie was definitely concerned about the secessionist movements at home. And we have, of course, political mischief. Rhodesia, a non-existent country, wanted to stir up uh, problems anywhere uh, in, in Africa that they could. Rhodesian mercenaries were on both sides. Huh? Which side Israel supports? Rhodesia? No, Israel. Which side of Israel supports the Israelis? Uh, okay, if we look at these people, Portugal, Rhodesia, Biafra, Israel, all their support was for Biafra. Uh, and all of it was secret. Okay? Uh, the British, uh, you know, they, they were locked in history and they could not escape from the uh, idea that Nigeria was a British um, protectorate, a British uh, Commonwealth member. The French, uh, on the other hand, were at odds with the British. And the French were actively supporting uh, Biafra, not heavily though. I, I mean, it, it, it was mainly sales, uh, but significant, um, you know, like 60 tons of arms came from France to Biafra. And a lot of the logistics was uh, dependent on French and uh, British support. Now if you look at 50 years later, you can look at correspondence, cable traffic, and so on. A lot of stuff going on about the oil. Everybody knew that high-grade oil and great abundance was there in the Delta, and whoever won this war was going to control vast wealth. And that was dominating French and British. So Shell Oil shifted its royalties to Britain and the French made deals with the Biafrans that if they could win uh, all those agreements would shift to France. Uh, okay, here's a country that had the only military unit operating planes uh, in the area. Groups on the ground and in 1968, Pierre Trudeau is saying, and Biafra, where's Biafra? Uh, well, why would he do that? Why is he keeping it secret? Here's two, uh, you know, there were four uh, uh, planes donated by the Canadian government, one operated by Canadian uh, and yet, the Canadian Prime Minister is denying that this place even exists or indicating confusion. He was worried, and now if you look at correspondence, he's worried about France, Pierre, you know, Viva le Quebec Free, right? Libra. Viva le Quebec Libra. Uh, 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 De Gaulle had made a speech. He didn't want to be part of any secessionist movement anywhere because he had Quebec to worry about. And uh, even his military people, when they went on these fact-finding missions, they lie. I mean, they're just, you read this, these reports and they are just, it's sort of like Trudeau writing a memo to himself. It's terrible, okay? so. I just gave this talk in Toronto, by the way, so I thought I would share that with you. The Russians saw an opportunity to get a footing, uh, and so they supplied arms, uh, arms of all sorts, uh, and uh, started to engage in commercial agreements that uh, were to their benefit. Johnson, uh, was a one Nigeria uh, uh, policy guy. 
he, uh, he the stuff he said was horrible about this. He he didn't want to see this anymore on TV. He didn't want to hear, but he just wanted this whole thing to end. Can and he would he shout at his people, "Can you do something?" He's pursuing the one Nigeria policy and two Vietnam policies, and he mixed everything up. He thought that if you bomb Biafra with food, you're uh, addressing the possibility that the Russians are going to advance their influence in Nigeria. So whatever Johnson did, he thought he was fighting the Cold War. Then, of course, in 68, Nixon gets elected. And there's a rearrangement of political thinking where the Democrats are pretty much pro-Biafran. And the Nixon administration is split. And this guy is the point person, Al Haig, reporting to Kissinger, who is actually a one Nigeria fan, but as Nixon starts to waffle and become more and more sympathetic to Biafra, uh, Kissinger shifts from being one Nigeria to pro-Biafra with the uh, folks in the uh, National Security Council becoming pro-Biafra and the State Department pro-Nigerian. So you have the Nigerian civil war going on inside the American government. And it's fun. You can read all this, and you realize that Nixon, you know, he doesn't know what to do. Uh, he's in the middle. So his compromise is to say, send food, planes, tons of food. This is 1969 ramp up American involvement in every way. I didn't know what was going on, but all of a sudden, people like me got visas. You know, like we, we couldn't have been involved uh, before this, but uh, Biafra wanted American involvement. There was, a, by 69, there's this whole array of organizations engaged in uh, activities, most of the international attention focused on a highway called Uli Airstrip, where flights were landing. Most of the supplies, however, were coming to Nigeria. Remember, there were no people in these places. They'd all fled. But the food welled up. Thousands of tons of food welled up, being shipped by the World Food Program and others uh, to these coastal uh, areas. Uh, what got all the attention was eight um, uh, C-97 uh, aircraft we had been donated by the American government to the International Red Cross and the Joint Church of Action. Old planes, uh, DC-7s, DC-6s, flew out of Fernando Po and Sao Tome. And there were a couple of these uh, C-130s. Uh, this is mainly how I committed to work on, on these things. Uh, this uh, Bel Air uh, aircraft were very old, but they were going out of business at that time as uh, uh, aircraft were being upgraded to jets. So they're very cheap. And they flew out of these places, first to Port Harcourt, but then Port Harcourt was lost uh, to the Nigerians, and Uli became the only place where they could go. Uh, this is uh, a scene uh, at uh, Santa Isabel of the offloading. Uh, political problems ensued because Nigeria, of course, is trying to control this and uh, prevent this. This is one of the very few photographs of Uli Airstrip in the daytime. Uh, imagine um, a uh, four-engine aircraft landing on a uh, 25-meters highway in night. OK, no lights, just guys standing along the road here. 
with uh, torches. They'd put the torch down and, and uh, put it out, and then you would uh, uh, you'd have to operate. My job was the load master, so I had to load uh, about six and a half tons of, of food, uh, supervise the loading, and then ride into these uh, air, uh, uh, on these flights and supervise the offload, offloading. On the ground, there were these teams. This guy, Charlie Cullum, showed up. He smuggled himself into Nigeria. He just flew from Australia to Lagos, took a public bus, found his way across the Niger River and showed up. And he started talking. I said, can you fix it? I asked the wrong question. I said, can you fix a truck? He said, yeah. Yeah, maybe I can fix a truck. I can fix Layla. And I know. I said, can you do anything else? He said, yeah, I'm a thoracic surgeon. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so that was Charlie. Smuggling Charlie out after the war was a major uh, problem. This is the kind of stuff that came in. You can see a lot of it had the American, uh, uh, there was a lot of waste, uh, junk flown in. Uh, Fortunately, never got on a plane, but there was a ton of suntan lotion that uh, came. I mean, just a lot of junk, but some of the this Icelandic uh, stockfish was excellent. It was high protein, uh, highly prized, uh, a very good uh, relief item, uh, uh, perfect for the situation. Uh, there were products invented by Biafra that were uh, super rich in protein. They're mixtures of, of oil and uh, uh, protein that could be used clinically to treat, uh, create uh, uh, a, uh, uh, to treat a severely malnourished child. This was a blended product that was wonderful, uh, an American invention. So, Corn, soya milk blend, and K-mix too were the stalwarts of the relief action. There's a strategy. If you tried to run a nutritional screening program, you didn't have this kind of equipment. You had to do something. And um, the idea of the Quakers, now the Quakers were run by uh, a sociologist. Uh, their team. And what he did is he figured out that very simply rule a stick where the ruling on the stick were corresponding to cutoff points where uh, if a child was too thin for the size of their arm, they were too tall, right? Tall would expect. And that was an index of malnutrition. And you could rule these sticks according to percentiles based on a chart. So I got involved in preparing these charts, but the idea was to have aerial survey work to gauge where the nutritional crisis was worse, and then in a locality of high risk, you'd have a screening program that would identify the high risk, the, I mean, the, these, these kids were, in, in a sense, moribund unable to walk or move. These kids were severely malnourished. And then over here, some healthy children were thin, but had recovered. And the idea was to get as many kids moving into the system in this direction. That was the strategy that the Quakers developed. Um, and a fair bit of research was done to, to make all this work. Uh, the sick bay is where these kids were most, um, uh, the most severe found their way into these sick bays. This is where you worked. Uh, and uh, uh, here you can see, here's a child who was so sick they couldn't eat. So they had to be fed with a nasal tube. Uh, but it was amazing. If you give a kid who's so sick they can't walk, or talk, or eat, or move, within hours, they're up. 
they recover amazingly. So the screen, this program, where it was applied was quite an efficient way to manage uh, the operation and get things to the point where uh, any surplus food could be managed through an uncooked food distribution program, okay? So that was the scheme. I could say that the CSM was wonderful because it tasted bad. Ugh, it's, you know, ugh. And I remember a guy standing next to me and saying, you know, because every bag had this symbol on it. He, he said, you know, I can't see how you Americans can stand this stuff. But it was wonderful because adults would force uh, this high protein nutritional supplement on children and it had less black market value uh, because it was bad tasting, but uh, good stuff. Okay, so that was the scheme, but a lot went wrong. And I think we should uh, talk about some of the problems. This is Father Byrne, an Irish uh, cleric, who was getting constant communication from his colleagues early on, like 67, uh, 68, and what he did is he formed an alliance uh, that led to the importation of 60,000 tons of food just by Caritas alone. Uh, but he worked with this guy who was a professional arms smuggler. Okay? So here's an alliance with the approval of the Pope. They worked with an international arms smuggler who was also working in Rhodesia and, you know, anything goes with, with Hank Wharton. Uh, and here's, this guy's a friend of mine, my counterpart in Sao Tome is David Corrin. You can see here, here's a flight uh, schedule, uh, but there are these gaps, right? So the Biafran strategy was to have relief flights going and then create these gaps through air control for Hank Wharton or people like him, like an air shell game. Sometimes they get us up in the air, we'd be circling around and around and around and knowing that there was an arms flight in the formation, right? And they would go in, the Nigerian Air Force wouldn't know which one of us was a smuggler and which one of us was a humanitarian relief. So you can see there's Canadian, Dutch, this guy is, uh, he's a problem because he's Danish, but he's an arms smuggler and a food importer. Uh, I can say that the arms were never on the same plane with the food and everything was trying to, sort. we weren't allowed to talk to any of these people. But uh, this was the strategy that Biafra developed. And they had these planes flying at night. Uh, these were flown, these bombers were flown in arranged by Niger uh, Soviet diplomacy. And these were flown by East Germans and by uh, uh, some, by Rhodesians. Now, can you imagine Rhodesians flying a, a MiG-19 while well, that was going on. On the ground, you can see, uh, here's, here are the gray ghosts. This is an arms smuggler, right? So he's smuggling arms, and right behind him is a joint church action flight. So the Nigerians actually had a good point that right there on the runways, taking off into Biafra and then circling Biafra, it's this mixture of arms smugglers and food uh, relief people. This is arms going into this plane. And uh, right behind it is a Canadian uh, a relief flight. Well, um, this is one of our planes. And as I say, the airlift was not an easy commute. Uh, there's 
Tay aircraft on the ground. Um, uh, so you'd see that as you're going in. The flight was at night. Uh, landing on a highway with not proper lighting or navigational equipment. And these planes were um, either bombing the runway or uh, shooting at the planes as they'd go in. So it's a combination of anti-aircraft and um, uh, uh, and uh, fighter plane. The air, uh, Uli airstrip, uh, this is a picture I took. Uh, immediately after the war, there were 35 graves uh, of people who died in the uh, airlift uh, alone. Uh, others died in other ways in other places, but quite. Uh, in the Army, one of the first things they did is they took bulldozers in and just flattened all this. So it's lost. Um, Okay, so the uh, airlift was the shell game, uh, logistic shell game. Uh, workers who were involved were often uncompensated. Uh, the loading and offloading equipment was primitive. Uh, uh, and one thing these guys agreed upon was that this airlift was the key factor protecting Biafra. I think it was over overhyped. The war probably uh, would have gone on even without the humanitarian side. The Biafran people were so dedicated to this conflict that they were prepared to fight even if they didn't have the humanitarian side. But Gawan uh, felt that the airlift was uh, a cover. Uh, and it was directed to shoot at Red Cross facilities. So if there's a Red Cross on the roof, that was a target. And the relief action learned not to identify their facilities as, as humanitarian uh, points of because uh, that would uh, lead to uh, strafing or bombing or something. Anyway. As a result, hospitals look like this. Uh, they take some sort of makeshift structure, make it look like a traditional uh, unit. Here's Charlie. Uh, surgery. Uh, and uh, this is uh, a major healthcare facility in a quite a makeshift uh, fashion. Problem was, that while this war was going on and Biafra existed, the teams involved resisted this triage and this organizational scheme. Okay? One or two did implement it this way. But for the most part, they were affiliated with churches in the parish of that church or the locality where they knew. They could, they, all these teams developed territory and functions that were based on mass food re relief, but mass food relief didn't have food to go with the strategy, right? So you'd have all these people maybe assembled on a Thursday because a flight had come out and all the food on that flight was dried skim milk. So everybody get dried skim milk. And then there'd nothing, be nothing more for another week or two. See what I mean? So it was a chaotic uh, strategy on the ground when the crisis was at its worst. And uh, nutritional triage, which could be organized, uh, was something that was resisted. There were a lot of kids who were apparently healthy but then there would be kids out in the village who were nutritionally vulnerable and who were very weak, who didn't find their way to the feeding point or weren't noticed by anyone. So there were these missing, um, uh, uh, missing kids. You had to have active outreach, and part because their parents were there. Nobody was doing anything to care for the most vulnerable children. 
Uh, so uh, you had this problem of passive demand. So they, they were, they, I mean, how can you say in a crisis like this that people didn't want food? Uh, but they did. And uh, the idea was to generate information, services, outreach, and so on that would create this climate of demand or mobilizing the climate of supply so that you had a more active engagement with the population than you would have if everything was just uh, food center based or passive. Uh, this transition was virtually impossible to implement in the conflict of, uh, in, in the peak periods of the conflict. Because everybody uh, felt that it was too uh, research ground or too, too difficult to understand. They just wanted to do what they could do in the, in the moment. Uh, but with this strategy, you could get by this kind of chaos. This is, if you went anywhere, a crowd would gather expecting something to be done for them. But with, uh, with uh, the quack stick, you could actually organize communities to identify who was uh, uh, best uh, uh, treated. And you could identify people who were vulnerable and, and uh, a preventive program. Uh, teams, when the front move, teams, why would the Lutherans move to a Catholic area? Or, you know, is that kind of logic? So you had uh, real problems with the way these teams were constructed. Uh, we had no training. There was not even a workshop of any kind for any of us to understand anything about this conflict or what to do in this situation. Uh, and we came and went. Uh, you, you would be there for two months, and that would make you an expert. Uh, and the uh, uh, whole situation was, in a way, a crisis within the relief action uh, that really was poorly organized because there was no one responsible for organizing anything. Uh, volunteers uh, could be uh, deployed. There were Biafran uh, medics of all kinds, all kinds of people who were willing and able to take on responsibilities. It took time for the war to reach the point where these people were adequately uh, 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 respected and deployed uh, to do what they could do. Raw food distribution, which was the major uh, relief theme, was almost always a disaster because you gave up control of who got the food. It would go in the wrong direction in the extended family system. Uh, and also, there were problems because children who were maybe most vulnerable were <laughs> cared for and fed by elder siblings. So how do you run a triage system? How do you select who's to get food on an individual basis when everything in this part of the world is corporate? Everything depends on the family. And, and here's something I call the cooking pot household. Who was responsible for nutrition was not the maternal, uh, the mother of a child, but maybe some else in the extended family who was responsible for the cooking pot and all the children who would eat at that pot, right? So you'd screen children on the basis of uh, biological parentage, but that's not where they ate. So there was a disconnect between the way screening was conducted and the way uh, uh, kids were cared for. There was a notion that you give ration cards to kids. Uh, OK. Uh, and what happened was these ration cards became sort of a form of currency. So uh, these kids would give the ration card to their parent. And it, when you go to the market, 
and you can see stacks of ration cards being given as like currency and change being issued in ration <laughs> cards. Uh, so we had this idea that you take silver nitrate, dilute silver nitrate and stain thumbs. Uh, here's my hand, you can see for ethical reasons, I just wanted to demonstrate that this is harmless. So my nail was colored. Choose a finger to, as an index of the severity of the case. And then as the nail grows, the, uh, the uh, silver nitrate uh, would grow out. And you could just look at the hand of somebody and see their nutritional status and history without a ration card. Uh, OK, so uh, this is the scheme. Uh, it, I, again, it didn't work widely. It wasn't accepted. You can probably see, what's wrong with this picture? Uh, well, this woman's an Irish nun. Very, these outfits, these stupid outfits, had been flown in at huge cost and risk so that they could have outfits to keep these children warm. Now, nutritional adversity does require uh, this kind of care. Cloth could be obtained. And these cute little kids with the cute little outfits were a pain in the ass. Because imagine you're flying in this stuff instead of uh, stockfish. OK, so she told me, I told her that the next bale of the stuff that comes in, I'm going to arrange to have it flown out on an empty plane. She said, you are going straight to hell, my friend. Uh, so we, as a coordinator, you had awkward moments. Uh, these teams were not directed by anybody. There was no governing authority. And on the ground, you didn't know what was going to come. Uh, you know, you didn't know what was going to come next. OK, then American diplomats show up, OK? A whole caravan of diplomats. I don't want to get into the detail. But their mission was to reopen Uli Airstrip at, as the war ended. The Nigerians, at that moment, were plowing up Uli Airstrip. It was a symbol of Biafran resistance. They weren't going to have an airlift. So those of us on the ground wanted a truck uh, logistics system. The Americans wanted. Uh, and so this guy who promoted this was concerned that here thousands of tons of food were welling up in the ports not finding their way in, he saw somehow an airlift would be a solution. We thought maybe trucks would be a solution. Uh, and as, you, as I tried to negotiate with this guy, just sort of, could you shut up, kid? You know, just, and so multiple times I was told to shut up. But uh, this concern with the airlift resulted in this guy being expelled from Nigeria and diplomatic relations between the Americans who were providing this food and the Nigerians who had won the war at this point. This guy's name is Gene Dewey. Uh, that's who I dealt with at some point. But Gene Dewey showed up as Gene Dewey, but a different person at one point. Uh, and that different person, Gene Dewey, the second time I met him, was this person. OK? I swear I can't prove it, but these guys didn't look that much. And having met this guy, and because I was such a flunky, he didn't remember me. But the next time the guy shows up, you know, and it's I know he was in Nigeria, but I can't prove that they swapped passports or something. And Al Hag was on a fact-finding mission. What we were trying to do 
is get Germans working with the British in ways that would coordinate their different logistics capabilities, small trucks, uh, working with big trucks. Uh, that uh, worked well, but the problem was that the American and the relief action view of the war was focused on Ade Kunle, this genocidal maniac who had been in charge of the army, uh, instead of the guy who replaced him, this Olu Shegun Obasanjo. This guy was really, in my view, a humanitarian uh, uh, general. Uh, and his troops, although they were engaged in pillage and mayhem and uh, looting, here's a guy sharing, his, his humanitarian mission is to share cigarettes with children. But the same guy could also be involved in a more appropriate uh, relief action activities. We figured out that private trucks that had been hidden could be unearthed or be offered military equipment that was not functioning, could be repaired, if only we had cooperation with the Nigerian army. So this truck had been buried. It was dug up like, uh, like yams or something. It had been hidden from the Nigerian army. We got military passes. We could put it into service by paying these drivers uh, Nigerian currency. This is after the war. Uh, and, and by subsidizing the black market, creating a black market in food by giving them a tenth to a quarter of the commodities that they would move from the coast. I got criticized for that. Uh, but I'm going to conclude now. The war ended near your village. Uh, and uh, there were legacies that uh, came from this. The main question is, concerns the politics of humanitarian relief. Uh, obviously, the UN works only on the side of sovereign states, but a whole uh, proliferation now of uh, international agencies has emerged, uh, and a whole idea of people-centered uh, planning has emerged from this, where uh, instead of basing thing, uh, 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 decisions on area, there's more understanding of social engagement for relief. Uh, and this, uh, I would like to say that people's oriented programming and emergency relief had its origins in Biafra. Uh, the whole idea of implementation science and applied it in the course of an emergency was also a, uh, an innovation from Biafra. And the need to think in terms of the end of conflict as a strategic uh, scheme for dealing with the uh, logistics at the, at the immediate closure of the conflict. The lack of strategic planning was a big problem. Uh, OK, neither army was disarmed. OK, so all these kids just held on to their machine guns. And uh, that made our lives very interesting because we had spontaneous roadblocks, uh, all kinds of pressure uh, by troops that were either in the business of looting systematically or threatening us because we were the people with money and resources uh, in this uh, situ situation. It was clear to us at the time that the war was not really over. The problems were just transitioning to something else. And indeed, now, this is a recent photo, Biafra is back in the news. So, and the final uh, issue here is what is the ethics of clandestine uh, humanitarianism. People argue that the airlift, by providing this cover, actually prolonged the war and prolonged the suffering and caused more uh, suffering than, than it should have. Uh, so 
this is a quote by Smiley. They make powerful arguments based on published literature saying that because this shell game was going on, uh, there must have been an extension of the war that was related to the relief action. I argue, though, and I've written, that the public, by supporting this war as long as they did, uh, uh, were the real uh, supporters of, the, of its extension. And the army uh, was so undisciplined at the beginning of the war that if there hadn't been this resistance, it would have been a horrific uh, uh, era of, of genocide. So this sustained support and the uh, characteristics of the army led to this 30-month conflict. Uh, also, the nutritional crisis didn't go away just because the war ended. Uh, and, uh, and as I pointed out, the relief action was the target of the Nigerian forces. If, the tar if you're a target, you're not really providing cover for anybody. Uh, and uh, that's my story. Sorry I went on a little bit too long. But, uh, I hope I gave a little time for questions, the comments. <laughs> kind of leaves us speechless, but uh, is this on? Yes. You've emphasized that you see at present um, circumstances in Biafra that resemble those that led to the original rebellion and war. Um, do you see any circumstances that could go in another direction that could prevent the repetition of such a catastrophe? In that country? Um, at present, at present. Yes. I, I think uh, maybe um, Fernando would like to join in, but I think that many uh, people who are maybe uh, over uh, 50 are terrified of the prospect of war and uh, are definitely one Nigerian in their, their sentiment. They, they do not want, they recognize the horror of war, but there's no teaching of this war in school and there's no um, real economic opportunity for youth. And half of the population is under 25. So it's the youthful, unemployed, restive population who see the corruption of the country, political malaise, and no future for themselves as fueling the uh, pro-Biafran movement. So I think Biafra is sort of a symbol of current frustration. So if there could be better governance and more equitable distribution of the oil wealth and things that uh, could offset some of this poverty, that would be the solution. Yeah. Um, they, yeah, sorry, yeah. Um, you're right, the, most of the uh, movement for the rebirth of Biafra is from the youth. Anybody who went through this war does not want another Biafra. Besides, the conditions that existed in 1968 and 67 were ideal. Uh, Biafra is now landlocked, so there's no way it's, it would be suicidal to try to secede now. Um, the only thing is that um, the government is so frightened of any insurrection that they are using sledgehammer to kill a flag and then inducing a counter response which is irrational and that's the danger of 
another conflict which nobody uh, will win, but can create another catastrophe. And that's what everybody's afraid of. Um, there's a reaction. Are there other questions before we go on here? Okay. There's a reaction to Boko Haram that I am aware of. I've had recent projects uh, where I had the opportunity to just sit. And I like to talk about the third beer conversation. You know, the Nigerian beer is you know, a very large bottle and it's wonderful beer. So you're sitting with Nigerian officers, all of whom were from the southwest of the country. And I was asking them about Boko Haram and the, they're just laughing. And they said, oh, let them go. Let them have their way. I said, what? Uh, that's, we could finish them in a week. We could do this, we could, but we're, why take a risk? Let them go. Their housing, their, uh, their this and that. Let the houses be, have their house of land, and if it's, uh, you Americans, you're afraid of all these Muslims. We've dealt with them before. We're not afraid of anybody like that. Just let them go. I thought, wow, these are Nigerian officers in the north of the country, uh, all agreeing on this theme. Uh, so I think the bigger problem is not so much Biafra as this uh, problem of separate ethno-linguistic political identities. I don't know if you agree. Well, the, uh, like, there's um, different, so Boko Haram is the northeast and northwest. And then you have the delta, you have an insurrection in the delta area where the, the, uh, the whole area has been devastated by oil spills and so on. Nobody has done anything about it. So locals are um, uh, rising up uh, in protest. Then you have the Biafran, uh, the young people in Biafra. So, uh, and then you have a new problem of the northerners from other countries now coming in and settling in the southern Christian areas, unchecked. Okay, so the, the, the country is in a state that can explode at any time. And unless the government is mindful of what it's doing, we may have another catastrophe in the future. Well, I really want to thank you. I, I, to me, it's, it's astonishing how, how we've forgotten so much about about it, which when we look at the pictures, you wonder how you could have for, forgotten so much. And, uh, and for sharing your life and your, your bravery and your wisdom with us, we thank you very, very thank much. Thank you. Well, by the way, if anyone wants this, it's completely fr 